The nation longed for deliverance, a leader to free them from tyranny. They knew the story well. God would send a mighty warrior, but they never expected a defenseless child. It was said the government would be upon his shoulders, but so would a criminal's cross. He would take the throne of his father David, but first he must pass through the veil of death. Each Christmas, we remember the unconventional arrival of this king, and we too know the story pretty well. We see the wise men on our Christmas cards tracing their westward journey. But these are Gentiles. They've come to worship a king for all people. Each year we sing of shepherds watching flocks by night, but these aren't exactly royalty. They remind us that this king lifts up the lowly. At Christmas, we celebrate a child's birth, but this infant is also the eternal king who spoke creation into existence, and he still speaks. Good morning. Merry Christmas to you. This is the first Sunday after Christmas, and so we continue the, uh, the looking at the stories that surround this special event. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord God, as we gather this day, why we ask for your special presence to continue to be uh, in our hearts and lives as we uh, walk through these days of Christmas. Grant us that joy that comes from knowing that as you come among us, why indeed, why we find blessings and it lifts us in ways that enable us to find joy and along uh, with Simeon and Anna, why we praise you. Grace us, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's pause now as Colleen prepares us with the prelude. <laughs> Join in singing, Good Christian Friends Rejoice, verses 2 and 3. Yeah. 
in the presence of God and of one another. Please use this time of silence for your own personal prayer. God of goodness and loving kindness, we confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. We have turned away from your invitation to new life. We have turned away from the lowly and downtrodden. In your abundant mercy, forgive us our sins, those we know and those known only to you. For the sake of the one who came to live among us, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Hear the good news of peace and salvation. God forgives us all our sins, not through our own work, but through Jesus Christ, made known to all people, with all who come to the manger rejoicing in this amazing gift of grace. Amen. Amen. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, you wonderfully created the dignity of human nature and yet more wonderfully restored it. In your mercy, let us share the divine life of the one who came to share our humanity, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We now prepare our hearts for the reading of the lessons for this, the first Sunday of Christmas. Our first lesson is a reading from the 61st chapter of Isaiah and tells us that to the people who return to Jerusalem after the exile the prophet proclaims that God's salvation will fully come to pass Jerusalem will become a shining light to the nations and righteousness and praise will spring up as surely as the earth puts forth vegetation I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name, that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Here ends the first lesson. Let us now read Psalm 148 responsibly, beginning with the Antiphon verse. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise, praise the Lord, all you angels. Sing, sing praise, all you hosts of heaven. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praise, all you shining stars. Praise, praise the Lord, Lord heaven, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, who commanded, and they were created, who made them 
and stand fast forever and ever, giving them a law that shall not pass away. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and fog, tempestuous wind, doing God's will, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world, young men and maidens, old and young together. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name only is exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the people and praise for all faithful servants, the children of Israel, the people who are near the Lord. Hallelujah. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Our second lesson is a reading from the fourth chapter of Galatians and tells us that Paul seeks to show the Galatians that the purpose of Christ's birth was to liberate us from the law's condemnation so that we would be fully adopted into God's family as beloved children. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir, through God. Here ends the second lesson. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer, night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Some thoughts as we consider these words of the gospel lesson. Three of the programs embedded in the popular masterpiece mystery television series on public television are set in the university town of Oxford, England. Each episode begins in the same way. A string of seemingly unrelated incidents follow, one after another, in rapid succession. The viewer is left to wonder what's being presented is not only simply window dressing before the real story begins. A typical episode might begin something like this. We see a young man riding a bicycle when he is nearly sideswiped on a narrow street. Then we are on the university campus where a harried professor is dashing from lo one location to the next. Then we see a woman working in her garden. Then comes a street scene somewhere in the city. Then there is a nightclub where a youngster is dancing beneath strobe lights. Then comes an organ loft in a local church where a musician is playing a piece by J.S. Bach. The list of snapshots goes on and on until the viewer is nearly dizzy with them. Those who watch these programs with regularity know that none of the opening incidents are incidental. One dare not ignore any of them. All of them will be important for the story that is about to unfold. Often if the program is rerun at a later date by the viewer who watches it, for the second time realizes the significance of some or all of those opening sequences in ways that was not initially appreciated. What has any of this got to do with an old man, an old woman, and a baby, and the great temple in Jerusalem in B.C. 4? Just this. The writer of Luke's gospel story has embedded clues in his narrative. They are not immediately apparent to the reader or the hearer. One may ask why some of these details even need to be in the story, or whether they are throwaway ornaments simply inserted in order to make the tale sound more interesting. Be not deceived. Luke knows what he's doing. Everything is there for a reason. Luke is the only gospel writer who gives us a story about two elderly seekers who frequent the national shrine of the Jewish church. That in itself is a clue. Luke cares about vulnerable people. No one is more vulnerable than an aging man and an equally aged woman nearing life's end. One could view Simeon and Anna as has-beens, people whose years have nearly run out and don't matter anymore. Luke presents them to us as individuals who have something to contribute, even in or perhaps especially because of old age. But the story of Simeon and Anna contains another clue to this gospel writer's priorities. Luke wants to introduce to his readers and hearers, including us, a theme that will return several more times in his story. Arguably, we already heard this theme in Luke's version of the story of Jesus' birth. Only in Luke do we have a story about shepherds, marginalized, unimportant, unkept castoffs from respectable society, being elevated to a place of great importance. So let us visit the scene laid out before us. Aged Anna and Simeon, along with Mary and Joseph, were just following the rules. Anna and Simeon, who are in the autumn years of their lives, were looking to have their hopes and dreams fulfilled, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, the arrival of the long-awaited Messiah in Jerusalem at the temple. Where else would God-fearing, law-abiding Jews do that? That was also true for Mary and Joseph. They sought to follow the law and take their newborn son to the temple for a proper dedication. While the amazing circumstances of Jesus' birth must have shaken them, they still seek to respect their tradition. They are no different from us. Our restless hearts long for satisfaction, consolation, and fulfillment. We want our hopes realized and our fears calmed. So we turn to the various manifestations of the law, for example the customs, patterns, and traditions of life that we hope will assure us that we have arrived, or at least that we have done what is expected of us, like Anna, like Simeon, Mary, and Joseph. Their searches converge at the temple where all those who observe the Torah go to fulfill the law. 
Simeon's startling announcement makes clear that whatever God is about to do in Jesus, Jesus will disturb the status quo. Jesus will create opposition and hostility. Jesus will expose what really goes on in our human hearts as we try to hide behind the customs and traditions of the law. Simeon warns Mary that Jesus will be like a sword piercing her heart and will reveal her most inner thoughts that are similar to ours as we seek to satisfy our longing to be right. Pious Mary and Joseph, Anna and Simeon, will seek shelter in doing what is customary under the law. However, their pious searches were about to be shattered. How much of our piety and following the rules is a cover-up for the anxiety, distrust, and unfaith lurking in our hearts and inner thoughts? This little child will one day wield a sword that will cut open that facade and reveal the darkness lurking inside. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon declares that Jesus will bring a reckoning. There will be no neutral ground on which we can procrastinate or prevaricate. There can be no safety in doing what is customary under the law. Jesus will cause a division of the house. We either will believe or disbelieve his decisive presence because this child is destined for the falling and rising of many. For those who believe like Simeon and Anna, they will rise. There will be peace, salvation, light, and glory. But for those who do not, who disbelieve, who reject the promise and offer of this child, there is only a falling. For them there is no redemption of Jerusalem. There is no peace, salvation, or light. They are condemned to continue their search for answers, meaning, and hope and never be satisfied. That also includes all of us. None of us is without sin. The sword of the law cuts all of us to the heart and reveals the plight from which none of us can escape. Yet even in the face of this evidence, Simeon announces that God has long promised to not only save God's people Israel, but also bring light to the Gentiles. And this has arrived. God has finally answered the questions raised by our troubled hearts, but in an unlikely way, through a child born to an obscure family, sent to an obscure place, living in an obscure time. God delivers Simeon and Anna and us along with them to the peace for which we have been seeking, Jesus. In the simple act of faithfully performing their duties in presenting Jesus in the temple, Mary and Joseph revealed that Jesus was the one born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. In his humanity, Jesus joined all of us who are destined for falling under the law. Stuck in humanity's resentless pursuit of peace and consolation, he joined himself to the fate deserved of those who chose to go it alone. But that's not the end of Jesus' story. Simeon's prophetic words also foresaw a day when Jesus would cause for the rising of many, not only in Israel, but everyone else too, even Gentiles. In Christ's own rising, God frees us up for a life we could never realize on our own. Simeon and Anna saw this when Simeon first held the child in his hands. That revelation turned on the light for them. For them, this seeing was believing. The security that the law had promised, but never delivered, at last was theirs. The consolation for which they had searched endlessly, they had finally found. The peace for which they yearned had arrived. In Jesus, the words spoken by St. Augustine were also fulfilled. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Simeon, Anna, and Augustine's salvation is ours also. Our restless hearts can finally find their rest in Christ. With lives so changed, Anna and Simeon could not keep their mouths shut. There was only one way they could respond to such good news. They began to praise God and speak about the child. They became witnesses along with all the other peoples, the people of Israel and the Gentiles, for all who long for redemption, hoping for someone or something to set them free from the relentless demands 
an unending criticism, something or someone to liberate them from their unsatisfied and disconsolate lives. We are invited to join Simeon and Anna to declare that that time has come. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, help us to see, along with Simeon and Anna, this wonderful gift that you have presented before us, and recognize that in seeing why we believe that that gift is for all, and in the midst of that for allness, why we experience that wonder and peace that comes from knowing Christ as our Savior. Bless us as we worship you, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now sing, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming, verses 2 and 4. song of the angels, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Night and day, all creation praises you, O God. Strengthen your church across nations, denominations, and traditions. Fill us with wisdom and unify our proclamation of your forgiveness and mercy. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All creation is holy to you, O God. You cause the earth to bring forth its shoots and gardens to spring up. Protect hibernating animals and frozen lands that wait earnestly for longer days of awakening and growth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. 
The nations are upheld by your hand, O God. Cause righteousness and praise to spring forth, inspiring leaders to serve with compassion and integrity. Send your spirit of discernment upon legislators grappling with complex decisions for the sake of the common good. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Send the spirit of your Son into our hearts, O God. Come quickly to hearts that race with fear, hearts that break with grief, and hearts that long for wholeness, especially those we hold dear in our hearts. Reveal your power to heal and to save. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Adopt us into your family, O God. Bless our elders with the peace and joy of Simeon and Anna. Strengthen those who have retired, those who work in older age, and those in need of income, food, company, or health care. Connect young and old across generations. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Let us depart in peace, O God, according to your word. For John, apostle and evangelist, and all your saints, we give you thanks. Prepare our salvation in the sight of all your witnesses of every time and place. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, Come quickly to us with grace upon grace as we lift these and all our prayers to you. In the name of Jesus, amen.
We've appreciated your ways of providing some financial support throughout this pandemic time. We would want to remind you that uh, all gifts that are postmarked and received uh, with the postmark of December 31 will count in this calendar year of 2020. Let us pray. Generous God, you have given us life, this community, and these gifts of the earth that become the meal of your grace. Move in our hearts that we might use your gifts to bring hope and blessing wherever we go. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. In the wonder and mystery of the Word made flesh, you have opened the eyes of faith to a new and radiant vision of your glory, that beholding the God made visible, we may be drawn to love the God whom we cannot see. So God of creation, God of mercy and grace, God of our very breath, why we give you thanks that you have brought to us this marvelous gift we call Jesus on that Christmas night long ago. And so we pray that as you've claimed us as your people and you've called us from every tribe and nation to live in your spirit through the death and life of your son, Jesus Christ. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. He teaches us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us from your very self with the body and blood of Christ. Through this mystery, send us forth to proclaim your promise to a world in need, through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Almighty God, who sent the Holy Spirit to Mary, proclaimed joy through the angels, sent the shepherds with good news, and led the Magi by a star, bless you this day, through the Word made flesh. Amen. Our closing song is Once in Royal David City. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Thank uh -huh. Yeah. 
Go in peace. Share the gift of Jesus. Thanks be to God. May you have a blessed day and a blessed week. Be sure as you celebrate the new year, why you stay safe. May God bless you as we enter into that new year with hope and promise. In Jesus' name, amen.